last twitch. Even with a heavy dose of trepidation mixed in, it was glorious. She had to wriggle against me for a time before I'd let her loose. When I finally did, she shoved her hands against my shoulders, pushing away from me, drawing me out of her with one long, decisive pull. I couldn't help it. I tilted my head down to watch. I shuddered as I noticed the evidence of our passion on her thighs. It was a sight to behold if you're animal enough to like that sort of thing. I certainly am. She moved away from me without another word, striding naked into the bathroom. I collapsed back on the couch, feeling exhaustion creep over me. I didn't even have the wherewithal to be worried just then. I was nothing but spent. It seemed I blinked and she was out of the bathroom and dressed again, looking like she hadn't just rocked my world on her lunch break. I rallied myself enough to speak up when I realized she was just going to leave. Wait, I said weakly, barely keeping my eyes open. You didn't answer my question. She paused, eyeing me with spectacular detachment. Did you answer any of mine? Goodbye, Dante. Don't be here when I come back. Can you wake me up at the soonest possible moment? I murmured at the empty trailer, about a second before I passed out. Chapter 15 Doubt thou the stars are fire, doubt that the sun doth move, doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. William Shakespeare Past Scarlet Weeks went by and there was no progress in the police investigation. No arrests were made. I was too creeped out by Harris to pursue it. In fact, I actively avoided dealing with him. But with every day that passed, Dante became increasingly disturbed, and I became progressively more paranoid. I dropped out of drama exactly three days after the attack. Graham's house was just too inviting for me. And, of course, there was Graham herself, always there to greet me when I arrived. For the first time in my life, I felt like I had a home I was welcomed in, and I spent as much time there as I possibly could. I'd have dropped out of school without a qualm if I hadn't known it would have disappointed her. Dante didn't like it. He threatened more than once to quit football in response to my change in schedule. But perversely, I was the one that talked him out of it. We were codependent enough without inventing new reasons not to leave each other's sight. A few weeks later, I was willing to rethink my position on the matter. He was fighting again, I could tell. More than he ever had before, in fact. Coming home with more bruises than he could hide or football practice could account for. I didn't have to ask. The guys must have been talking about me again. And I knew just the types of things they'd be saying. When girls with my reputation were attacked, it was a no-brainer, to my mind at least that I'd be blamed for whatever the rumor mill was saying had happened. It had likely been blown out of proportion, and I figured I was either being called a liar or a slut. I didn't hear any of the rumors directly myself, but every new bruise on Dante's body told me the story as clear as though I were reading it on paper. Just when I thought I couldn't love him more. Detective Harris came to the house twice to talk to me, but he had no new information about the case, and as soon as he realized that Graham was as good as glued to my side, he quickly found a reason to leave. I do not like that man, Graham said after the second visit. She was studying my face. Darling, do me a favor. Always insist that I be there when he needs to speak to you. Always. I agreed happily. But Harris never came back to her house after that. Instead, he started pulling me out of my classes at school when he wanted to have a word. So much so, rumors started to go around that I was having an affair with the hot cop, as he'd been fondly nicknamed by the girls at school. It infuriated me, especially so since he never seemed to be doing anything to find the man that had attacked me. Instead, 
He wanted to have short, intense, meaningless conversations with me, always pretending it was official business. The third time he pulled me out of class, I was outright hostile toward him. Any updates on finding the man that attacked me, or are you just here to ask about my health again? We were standing near my locker. He'd asked me to show him where it was, and he was looking around, barely paying me any mind at all. I clenched my jaw. And if you want to talk to me, I'm going to need to call Vivian Durant. She's insisted that I not be alone with you. That got his attention, his head snapping toward me, eyes narrowing on my face. What did you tell her? You remember what I said, don't you? Everything about this case is confidential. If you share any information, with anyone, you could get yourself into big trouble. And we will never catch this guy. I bit my lip. It wanted so badly to tremble. What does this man want from me? I honestly didn't know. It seemed to me he enjoyed terrifying me, but I also knew I had some serious baggage where law enforcement was concerned. W w why did you pull me out of class? I told you I want to see your locker. Go ahead and open it up for me. I did, stepping back so he could look inside. What are you looking for? I asked him. How are you feeling? He countered. Fine, I bit out. Breasts still tender? I see you can wear a bra again. My shaking hands were in fists. They're fine. What are you looking for? He was standing right in front of my open locker, not touching anything, just looking. Clues? I'm a detective, you know. You sure don't act like one. Just sort of slipped out. I was immediately sorry. He didn't touch me, didn't lay one finger on me, but I felt physically intimidated nonetheless as he stepped into my personal space. Just because I'm police, he said very, very quietly, right into my face, doesn't mean I'm not a man, doesn't mean I can't be riled so I would show a little more respect if I were you, Scarlet. Not only am I the only one who is willing to help you, no one else on the force would lift a finger if something were to happen to you. Do you understand? You've burned every bridge but this one. I tried to take a step back, and that's when it happened. Harris grabbed my arms to stop me, to keep me from moving away, and I swear I felt his presence before I saw or heard him, like electricity in the air. Rage on the wind. Get your fucking hands off her! My eyes shut tight, in relief and horror, because I was saved and Dante was about to get himself arrested. This is none of your concern, Harris told Dante. Go back to class, son. Dante, my hero, my everything, was not intimidated by anyone, not even a cop and he was furious. He was in the older man's face without hesitation, moving between us, shielding me at the same time he put himself into harm's way. I was shuddering in relief, and I thought I couldn't love him more. Whatever happened, if Dante was here, he wouldn't let me be harmed. I knew it. Absolutely. What the fuck are you doing, putting your hands on her? Dante raged backing Harris into the locker. Don't you dare ever fucking touch her again, you hear me? The other man was so surprised, I think, that for a moment he let the younger, unarmed high school kid back him into the lockers and then shove him hard in the chest. Dante, no! I cried, right at the same time that Harris reached for his gun. I couldn't keep it in. I screamed. Dante almost almost kept going for it, his hand covering the other man's, a ghost of movement, but it was there. He was going for the cop's gun. But there was some sanity left in him yet, because at the last second, he took a step back, hands going up. On the ground, Harris snarled, pointing his gun right into Dante's face. I was sobbing as I took a step forward, and then another. Harris caught the movement and pointed at me with his free hand. Don't move another inch. Your boyfriend's in big trouble, and if you don't stay out of it, 
It could be the difference between handcuffs or a bullet, you understand? I backed off immediately. People were starting to spill out into the halls by then. Kids, teachers, all looking on in stunned disbelief. No one even talking. Get on the ground now! He screamed into Dante's face. Dante glared at the other man, his expression utterly dauntless. But he complied. I felt helpless as he cuffed Dante's hands behind his back and then dragged him to his feet. I found myself trailing after them as Harris began to lead him out. Stay here, Harris said curtly. Go back to class. I'm fine, Dante told me, and though I couldn't see his face, he sounded composed, all things considered. I watched them leave with a pounding heart, following behind, far enough back that Harris didn't take exception, but close enough to see them get into his car. My mind was racing. I had no idea what I should do. So I did the only thing I could do. I called Graham. We were all surprised when Harris didn't arrest Dante. I was frantic in the interim as I coordinated with Graham to find out what had happened to Dante. I was so convinced that they'd be at the police station that I left school, taking Dante's car to pick up Graham. We were literally pulling out of the driveway when Harris drove up in his brown sedan, Dante in the back seat. Dante got out, and Harris drove away. I stopped the car, put it in park, and got out. I ran and threw myself at Dante with such force that it made him sway precariously for a beat before he settled back solidly on his feet and wrapped his big arms around me. I'm fine, shh, I'm all right, he said into my hair, voice pitched loud enough to be heard over my sobs. Did, did, did he hurt you? I gasped him. No, he didn't lay a finger on me. Calm down, Angel, shh, you're okay, calm down. He was stroking a hand over my hair over and over to soothe me. Slowly but surely, it was working. What happened? Graham asked him. She was, as always, the epitome of calm. He gave her the short version of what had happened at school. But he didn't arrest you? She asked when he finished. No, he just took me for a drive and then brought me here. And you know what? I don't think they're doing a damned thing to find the guy that attacked Scarlet. He straight up told me that they're not even close to making an arrest. And you know what else he said? They haven't even gone to look where we told them the guy hangs out. At this point, the only way they'll even find him is if he goes to the station and turns himself in. The more he revealed, the more agitated he became, until at the end he was raising his voice. Graham held up a hand, and he quieted. I'll start asking around about all of this. Harris, the case. I will get some answers, but I need you to stop getting into trouble. You're only making it worse, Dante. Harris was bothering me at school today. I defended him. Dante only got into trouble helping me. She studied us both, looking more ruffled than I'd ever seen her. Jesus, what the hell is going on? That scared me more than anything. If Graham didn't know what to do, the cause seemed completely lost. She took a few deep breaths and seemed to regain her composure. Like I said, I'm going to get some answers. I believed her and was comforted. And I believe she would have if she'd had more time. But everything came to a head just two days later. I don't know just what Harris said to Dante, what seed he planted that troubled him so, but it took root quickly and flowered into this. Dante believed that the only way my attacker would be arrested was if he went to find him personally. He left in the middle of third period, but I only found that out later. I didn't even know he had gone at the time. When the news came, it was like a ripple moved through the school, information spreading like a furious gust of wind, I was not the most social, as usual, and so I wasn't the first to hear. I was blissfully ignorant for a few more minutes than the majority of the school. But when I heard the news, I was as shocked as everyone else was. 
Dante had been arrested for killing my attacker. Chapter 16 Never go to bed mad. Stay up and fight. Phyllis Diller Present Dante I woke up still on her sofa with a pounding headache and my cheek pillowed against a silky thigh. It was almost enough to make my heart on win out over my hangover. Almost and fingers, gentle, familiar fingers, stroking through my hair, lightly rubbing my temples. Was this real? Was I dreaming she was tending to my hangover as if she didn't hate me? Was even my dream mind longing for her scraps? What could be more pathetic than that? Am I dreaming? I mumbled into her skin. Do you really dream about feeling like shit? Because you look like shit. Almost was caving quickly to yes, please. Hang over. I murmured into her skin, turning my head to nuzzle, one curious hand sliding up her bare leg, trying without any conscious help from my brain to figure out what she was or wasn't wearing. Pants, no. Panties, yes, though they weren't much of a deterrent, and she wasn't resisting me, thank God. I fingered her, and she shifted under my cheek, her thighs parting just the slightest bit. It was enough. I slid to the floor, going to my knees in front of her. I made my way up her legs with my mouth, placing open-mouthed kisses against her thighs, spreading her legs wider as I moved higher, wedging my shoulders between. I licked the tender flesh of her groin with quick, wet flicks of my tongue, rolling my eyes up to watch her reaction. She made a little noise, higher pitched than a groan, but more stifled than a mule. I licked long and slow, right in that perfect little strip of skin at the very top of her inner thigh. She made the noise again. I sucked her flesh into my mouth, drawing hard, until she gripped my hair and cried out my name. I smiled and went down on her, spreading her legs wide, pushing the tiny scrap of lace to the side and kissing her, licking her, driving my tongue into her until I had her clawing mindlessly at my shoulders, just losing it, begging me to stop, to fuck her, to let up with my tongue. But I couldn't stop, wouldn't stop. My entire life was out of my control, but this, her body, her pleasure, was mine. She let me get her off, but the second she was done, she was up, moving away from me, agitated hands scraping her hair back from her face. I was still wiping my mouth as I studied her. She was wearing the shirt she'd worn earlier, but that was it. No bra, no shoes, makeup scrubbed clean. How long have I been out? I asked her. A while, she answered, still out of breath but trying to hide it. One hand braced against the counter, the other on her hip. Her back was to me. I'm done shooting for the day. She moved to the trailer's small coffee bar, and I watched her silently, eating up her every move as she began to brew a cup. When I realized she was making it for me, prepping it exactly how I took it, my heart did a slow, painful turn in my chest. What the hell was going on? Why was she being so civil? It undid me faster and more thoroughly than her hostility ever could have. Perhaps that was why. She reached up into one of the tiny overhead cabinets and fished something out. I heard more than saw the rattling bottle of pills, because my eyes were preoccupied with every inch of skin she revealed as she reached up. I shifted uncomfortably and it was only as I did so that I realized my clothes were off. She must have stripped me while I slept, leaving me in nothing but my boxer briefs. She brought me two ibuprofen and the just-right cup of coffee. I thanked her, eyes devouring her face, but she wouldn't look at me, instead giving the barest nod and turning away again. You took my clothes off while I slept. 
It wasn't an accusation so much as a question. It was the wind, she said absently, sarcasm present even if the will for it was not. She was looking at the counter, at the gift I'd brought her. What's that? It wasn't a question so much as an accusation. We'd always been good at balancing each other out. I don't know, I drawled. I think the wind carried it in when it was blowing off my clothes. I could only see a hint of her profile with the way she was turned, but I caught her ghost of a smile. My chest ached at the sight. To say I missed her was a cruel understatement, like saying you'd miss your soul after you gave it away, after it was torn from you. I was empty. Flesh without blood. I was not whole without her. Never would be. I wasn't a big enough fool to believe that could ever change. I downed the pills and took a long swig of my coffee. All the while she didn't move, just staring at the box. Open it, I urged her. I had no idea if she would. At that moment she was an utter enigma to me. I still couldn't figure out why she hadn't made me leave yet. Well, I had an idea, a gnawing, sickening suspicion, but my fear of the notion made me instantly reject it. Denial is a powerful thing. I tensed when I realized she was actually going to open the gift, leaning forward, resting my elbows on my knees. She took the Louboutins out of the box without a word, setting them side by side on the counter. Highness Strauss, she said reverently, did you just address your shoes as Highness Strauss? She shot me a look. That's their name. You know the name of the shoe. She actually looked sheepish for a short, endearing moment. It was adorable. It made me want to kiss her silly and fuck her mindless. But that was nothing new. What I mean is, I don't want them. She rallied. Quit buying me shoes, you stalker. Well, you can throw them away like the other pair, or do whatever you want with them, but I'm not taking them back, and I had to get you something. To congratulate you on landing the big part. She was back to drooling over the shoes. Why did you pick these ones in particular? She asked it with begrudging admiration in her voice. I'd done well. I had help, from one of our department store stylists. I told her you were deep into shoe porn that you only get off on the hardcore stuff. I warmed as I saw that she had to bite back her smile. And she recommended a few. These ones stood out to me the most. With a sigh, she set them back in the box, turning to look at me. What are you doing here? Her voice was almost gentle with the finest edge of pain. It was foreign on her so unaccountably vulnerable that it made me wince. I told you earlier I had a question for you. You didn't answer it. She waved her hand in the air, dismissing the notion. What I mean is, what are you doing in town? I stared at her because she knew the answer to that. Still, if she wanted to play pretend, I could do that too. I was, in fact, excellent at it. I'm here for work thought I'd stop by while I was in the neighborhood. She folded her arms together until she was almost hugging herself and just stared at me. Her face was tragic. It was too much. It knocked the wind out of me. I was undone with a glance. I couldn't even meet her eyes when she gazed at me like that. I looked down at my hands as an unmistakable wave of fear rocked through me. Her expression told me everything and nothing but one thing was for certain. She knew something she wasn't supposed to, and all of the rules had changed. I felt unutterable guilt at the relief that washed over me. It was so powerful that for a moment it nearly drowned out the fear, but only for a moment. Look at me. Chapter 17 Beauty, more than bitterness, Makes the Heart Break Sarah Teasdale Past Scarlet 
I'd heard rumors, and over the years they'd grown more persistent. Whispers about Jethro Davis. It was commonly assumed that he was my father. Even my doubtful grandma had admitted a few years prior that he was the most likely candidate. I'd never seen the man, but I hated the very idea that I could have a dad so close, in this very town, and he'd never even bothered to meet me. Never once bothered to see what his daughter looked like, if she was all right. Never bothered to make sure she didn't end up in a dumpster. I preferred instead to fantasize that he was someone glamorous, someone rich, maybe even famous, some man who didn't even know I existed, because if he did, nothing could have kept him away. But then, one day, I ran into Jethro Davis. The rumors I'd heard about him weren't only about him being my father. A lot of them were about the man himself, the things he did. He was a criminal, a drug dealer, and some said worse. That a few people who'd crossed him hadn't lived long to regret it. He'd served some time in prison. For what, exactly, I couldn't say. Assault and battery, some said. Armed robbery, I'd also heard. I was familiar with the story of my supposed father long before I ever set eyes on him. But when I did see him, at the grocery store, randomly, I knew who he was right away. I was in the peanut butter aisle, grabbing a few things off Graham's grocery list. Her housekeeper usually did all of the shopping, but she'd recently come down with a bad case of the flu, so I'd taken over the duty. I'm not sure why I was so sure right off the bat. The way he was studying me, maybe, or that combined with the tilt of his eyes, the stubborn line of his jaw. It wasn't his features so much as the way he moved them. There was a strong resemblance, but there also wasn't. He was a gorgeous man, just stunning, his face perfectly symmetrical. And it wasn't vanity, but I couldn't help seeing some of myself in him. And all of my fantasies about some heroic father who would have wanted me, had he known, flew right out of my head for good. He seemed as startled to see me as I was him. Hey, I know you, he drawled. No, you don't, I contradicted haughtily. He sure as hell didn't know me. He'd never have the privilege, I swore to myself. I do too, he said unfazed. You're Scarlet Thoreau. I hear all kinds of stuff about you. Quite the little charmer, I hear. Raising hell since you was low. Not much different from your mama. He smiled. He was beautiful, but I hated his face on sight. Not much different than your papa, either. Both of my parents are dead, I said, for lack of anything better. They were certainly dead to me. He laughed. Oh, you think so? I think you're full of shit. You know damn well who I am, don't you? I glared at him, but I didn't answer. I'm your daddy. You knew that, right? You're probably not too keen to hear that, but it's the truth. I can see the Davis blood in you, too. I haven't heard about that. Folks only been telling me how you're the spitting image of Renee, and I can see that. But I see me in you, too. No denying it. But I guess you don't care about that, huh? You done all right for yourself, I hear, living up at old Lady Durant's fancy mansion. I hated the way he spoke, slow, each word drawn out insinuatingly. Also, he sounded like a hick. What do you want? I asked him. Clearly, if he'd actually wanted to be my dad, he wouldn't have waited for an accidental grocery store run-in to introduce himself. He grinned, and I hated that it looked strangely familiar to me. You're in high school, right? That can come in handy for me. You interested in making some money, girl? I started to leave, without another word. He stopped me with a grip on my elbow. Now, now, it's good money. You wouldn't have to beg the Durants for charity no more. Don't you want a bit of cash of your own? I'd make sure it was all cake work. I just need some things, small packages, delivered to your classmates, yeah? Get your hands off me, you piece of... I snarled at him. Hey now, it's daddy to you.
just when you don't think you can hate yourself anymore. And then you find out you come from even worse white trash than you thought. Yeah, that's where I was sitting. His smile turned unpleasant. Got a little attitude on you. I shouldn't be surprised. You know who else had one? Your mama. Didn't turn out too well for her, I hear. That stopped me in my tracks. What is that supposed to mean? Do you know where she is? He laughed, and it was mocking. Can't say that I do, but I have heard things. Maybe if you were a little nicer to your old pa, I'd tell you some of the things I've heard about your mama. I tugged my arm free of his hand grip. What are you suggesting? How about you come up to my house with me? I have a nice little plot of land, and seeing as you're part of the Davis clan, I think it's time you come have a look. When we're there, I'll tell you what I know about where Renee, your mama, ended up. I was not nearly as dumb as he seemed to think. No way in hell was I going anywhere with him. Ever. I opened my mouth to tell him that when I was interrupted. Jethro Davis, how about you leave this nice young lady alone before I find something to arrest you for? I'd guess I wouldn't have to look much farther than your pockets if I wanted to get you for possession, yeah? I shuddered. This day was getting worse and worse. I'd just been saved from my low-life father by the only person I could possibly want to see even less than him. Jethro couldn't get away from me fast enough after that. And then I was left with Detective Harris. He gave me his deceptive smile. What a coincidence. How are you holding up? That had to be a shock. What your... Is he still your boyfriend? Did to that homeless guy? I hear he's managed to find a way out of it, though. Congratulations. It's amazing what money can do especially when you're dealing with a DA who's hoping to have a long political career ahead of her. It was self-defense, I said, voice and face hard. Everyone has a right to defend themselves. I said this the same way I'd said it a hundred times before, with stony resolve. I was used to defending what Dante had done. I'd never stop defending it, because I knew he'd done it for me. He smiled again. I apologize. I was out of line there. I didn't mean to upset you. I was actually just trying to help you. I saw that creep bothering you and thought I should intervene. Jethro was bothering you, wasn't he? I nodded, thinking it was ironic that this piece of work saw Jethro as the creep. But I begrudgingly said, Thank you, because Jethro had been bothering me. Any time, Scarlet. You know I'm always here if you need me. Always. I didn't like the sound of that one bit. I tried to move past him, but he stepped in my way. Listen, you may not see it now, but I thought I should warn you. Dante is dangerous. Dangerous to others. Dangerous to you. I just stared at him, wondering what his intention was. But his face and voice... He seemed genuinely worried for me, but with him, I didn't trust it. And his intention really didn't matter. Nothing on earth could make me afraid of Dante. He would die before he hurt me. He would die to keep me from being hurt. By anyone. This I knew. You think he defended you, I get it. You think it was, what, manslaughter? Self-defense, if you're being completely naive? But it was more, I promise you. He went into the woods looking for a man, and that man ended up dead. What is that, if not intent? I started shaking my head. He was wrong. I knew it for a fact. I'd looked into Dante's eyes while he told me what really happened. He'd gone looking for my attacker, intending to bring him to the police, since the police were doing nothing. But when he'd found him, the man had pulled a knife and attacked. They'd fought. Dante had tried to take the knife away, but instead, much to his horror, he'd ended up stabbing the man. He'd tried his best to get help, but my attacker had bled out before he could get the proper medical attention. Dante had told the story in painstaking detail and with utter sincerity, 
and I believed him unconditionally, even if I was one of the few. If he loses his temper again, how can you know it won't be you that ends up on the wrong end of it? He's taking anger management courses, I told Harris, not because I thought Dante really needed them, but because it seemed like something Harris should hear. You're not listening, Scarlet, or else you're not hearing me. But I want you to know that if you ever need me, I'm just a phone call away. You can come to me for anything. His words felt insinuating to me. They always did. But I just nodded and moved past him. At least he wouldn't be bothering me anymore. Not more than the random coincidence. My case was closed, thank God. Harris let me leave, and I went straight to check out. There was only one lane open, and I had the terrible luck of being directly behind Jethro. He sent me a greasy smile as he paid for his beer and cigarettes with his EBT card. Of course, this was not allowed, but when you're a small town's biggest drug dealer, things like that tend to just go your way. I glared at his back when he left. I sincerely hoped I never had to set eyes on him again. Meeting Jethro had bothered me. It was disheartening and disturbing to realize that even I believed he was my biological dad. Before, I'd always been able to shrug off any relation altogether, the rare times that it came up, because the idea had been as abstract as it was distasteful. I didn't want this man to be my dad, and so he wasn't. But not anymore. After that, I carried the weight of belonging to even more white trash heritage than I already claimed. It was a blow to my ego that I hadn't needed, to say the least. Not a day in my life had gone by when I hadn't known and been reminded that I was trash. More proof was just picking out a wound that was already bloody. One other thing did come out of meeting him, though. A lesson, or at least a reminder. I was not a Durant. Graham had accepted me into her heart, into her home. She fed me, clothed me. She provided me with everything I needed and more from my phone to my haircuts. She'd even tried to buy me a car, but I'd drawn the line there. No, I'm not crazy. I just couldn't do it. Couldn't defend taking such an extravagant gift, not without earning it. She had three extra cars. When I needed one, she always generously allowed me to borrow one. It was enough for me. And as much as I wanted to tell all of the people that looked down on me to go fuck themselves, I did care how it looked, how I looked, when it came to Graham and her kindness toward me. If the world thought I was taking advantage of that, then hell, maybe I was. And so I tried my best not to. So meeting Jethro Davis wasn't all bad. It made me realize that I needed to start earning my keep. Chapter 18 I love you as certain dark things are to be loved, in secret, between the shadow and the soul. Pablo Neruda Present Scarlet Filming was not going how I'd expected. It was a roller coaster. All ups and downs, nothing in between. A part of me hated it, and a part of me found it stimulating. At least I wasn't bored. The acting was the only thing I wasn't conflicted about. I loved it. Because, God, I was tired of being me. It felt good to slip into some other shoes. But the rest was a jumbled mess that consisted of changed scripts, new lines, and repetitive reshoots. Every scene felt like it had to be redone a dozen times, at least. I thought that all of this traced back to one thing, the director. He was hard to please and harder to impress. Stuart Wentley was known for making A-list, character-driven films that made the Film Academy swoon, and for being an eccentric, sometimes tyrannical, perfectionist. When I thought of it that way, things weren't actually going so badly. Still, it felt like I was somehow failing, and I had begun to miss my friends who were gone four days or more a week. And hell, even my crappy old airline job, 
or at least I hadn't felt I was incompetent. I had quit with relish over a month ago, never dreaming that I'd long to go back to it for even a second. I'd never admit any of it aloud, though, and even if I was doing a horrible job, I'd keep trying my best until I either got it right or got canned. It wasn't even a question. Is he always like this? I asked one of the production assistants, after Stuart had called an abrupt break and stormed off set. Again. Hmm? She asked. What I mean is, is this how a movie production is supposed to go? Or is this one just a colossal failure? I hoped that wasn't the case, but I needed to know if it was. I always, always preferred the truth. That had her finally looking at me, pushing her glasses up high on her nose to study my face. This project is as smooth as they get, to be honest. Usually filming with him is a nightmare. I was shocked, relieved, and somehow annoyed. But at least it wasn't me. Stuart was back within the hour, which was usually the pattern, and we set up again. Two takes later, and good old Stu was back to ranting. It's a journey back from feeling alienated from the world, he said passionately speaking directly to me. Well, that I could relate to. The second part of it, at least. It is about personal growth, not an explosion of it, but a gradual unfolding, petal by petal, bit by bit. This scene is supposed to make you blossom. He's doing something for you that no one ever has before. Showing you kindness, changing your perspective on people, on men. You two are supposed to like each other. And that was the whole problem. I couldn't stand the lead actor. He was a Hollywood asshole of the first order. I'd been excited when I heard who was chosen for the role. David Watts had seemed the perfect pick. He was successful, a household name, great looking, and because he was a hunk and he liked to post shirtless pictures of himself holding kittens on Instagram on a fairly regular basis... He brought his own rabid fan base to every movie he made. But how he sounded on paper was far from how he was to work with. Stuart got right up in my personal space, as he was wont to do, distracting me from my train of annoyed thought, spectacled eyes studying me closely. But you're not the problem, are you? You are her. You are this character. She is you. You are this movie. That is clear to me. So it's you we must begin to work around. What we need for this is chemistry. I'll ask you plain. Can you think of any man you have chemistry with that's fit to play this role? I was floored, but pretty thrilled. He'd really fire David Watts? Is that what he meant? I opened my mouth to respond, because hell, I'd find someone. But David interrupted with a grown-up hissy fit. Apparently, he wanted this job, too. David probably wasn't a terrible person. He was just out of touch with reality and normalcy, something I figured a lot of famous people suffered from. I'd have bet money from what I'd seen on set that he surrounded himself with people who only told him how awesome he was, that he was the most special snowflake of all the special snowflakes. People that never let him know when he was acting like an entitled douchebag. He wasn't even a bad actor. He had limited range, as most too good looking men do, but what he played, he played well. He'd just decided to be a dick to me since the first day we'd met, and he couldn't hide it even when the cameras were rolling. I was still a little bummed about it. I'd been excited to meet him, more excited when he wanted me to come over to his house to rehearse together. About two hours and a few drinks later into that first meeting, he'd asked me, way too bluntly and without an ounce of charm, if I wanted to fuck, and I'd politely turned him down. Okay, polite maybe wasn't the word. I tried to be polite, but I'm sure my version of a polite no had come across more than a touch sarcastic, and likely mocking. He hadn't taken the rejection well. I honestly didn't think he knew how to deal with it, so he turned it on me, told everyone I was difficult to work with, while taking exception to every word that came out of my mouth. 
I ignored it and tried my best not to let it show that I couldn't stand him when the cameras were rolling. I thought I succeeded. David didn't even try. I don't know if he thought he could bully me into wanting to sleep with him or if he was just that unprofessional. One thing was for sure. Before today, no one had dreamed there was a chance he could be fired. I don't want to fire you, Stuart told him when David had calmed enough to let someone else get a word in. I don't want to. I just may need to. Scarlet is electric. She's magic. Incandescent. She gives me life. She's my muse. And she was made for this part. But as soon as I put you together, everything goes flat. Flat! I can't have it be flat, David. Tell me how I can keep from firing you. That little speech, and fear of losing the role, seemed to help. David tried harder, became more civil with the next take, like a light had been switched on. A big heaping of humble pie had been just what the doctor ordered. What a spoiled brat. When we finished another take, it was to a spattering of applause and eccentric stew blowing kisses into the air. I was almost disappointed. I'd have loved to replace David with Anton, or hell, just about anyone. But if he was going to behave himself, I wouldn't be a butt about it. We were taking a short break while we waited for setup on the next scene, when my phone started ringing. It was Bastion. I took a deep breath and answered. I can't find Dante, he began. I closed my eyes, rubbing my temple with my free hand. He's here, I told him. What do you mean by here? Somewhere in town, or at least he was a few days ago, Bastion cursed. Damn it, I should have guessed. If you see him again, tell him I need him to call me. He needs to pull it together. Do you really think that's a good idea? I asked pointedly. If Dante knew I was talking to his brother, no matter the reason, I had no doubts it would send him into a jealous rage. I see your point, Bastion admitted wryly. Well, if you see him, will you figure out what he's doing there, where he's staying, and then let me know? If I see him, yes, I will. I stared at my phone long after the call had ended. Would I see Dante again? Did I want to? I was able to answer the first question much sooner than I'd imagined, as the next time I went to my trailer for a break, I found Dante sprawled out on my sofa. Again. And he was stinking drunk. Again. I didn't think it was the alcohol racing through his system, though, that made it so he couldn't meet my eyes. He'd come here to see me, and he couldn't even look at me. I'm not sure how that would have made me feel a few months ago, or even weeks. But with what I now knew, it made me feel wretched. And angry. Confused and conflicted. Wounded and lost. But also, it touched me deeply. How long had he been living this double life? Stuck in purgatory? Trapped in a vicious web of lies? Completely alone? Protecting me from everything? I, frankly, didn't even want to know. It is much easier to hate someone who you're certain has wronged you than it is to hate yourself. And I was very afraid that if I knew just how far back his lies went, my self-hatred would know no bounds. Dante? I said, my voice so soft that it forced him to look at me, his entire drunken face registering a sort of endearing surprise, like he'd forgotten where he even was. You look like hell. That being said, he made hell look good. His hair was messy, more scruff on his jaw than usual. I was still wearing the evidence of that scruff on my thighs from his last visit. And no, that wasn't a complaint. No suit for him today. Instead, he was wearing gray sweats and a zip-up hoodie that was open wide enough at the neck to expose his defined collarbone and the top of his muscular chest and the cursed chain that he never took off. Also, there was enough bared skin that I suspected he wasn't wearing a shirt under. If he weren't drunk, I'd have assumed he just came from a workout. He was dressed for it, down to his running shoes. 
How do you keep getting past security? I was mostly curious about it. I'd had to jump through hoops to get on set the first few times. They were so strict. How did he get so lucky? They think I'm your boyfriend. Why would they think that? I asked him. But I knew the answer. Because I told them so. And I bribed them. At least he was honest. For once. What are you doing here? I asked him point blank. His shaking hand pushed his hair impatiently back from his face. I'm here for the same reason I always come back to you. I've come for scraps, anything you'll give me. I've come because I can't stay away. His voice was low and hoarse from the drink, but thick and dark with emotion. I tried to. Don't you think that I'm always trying to stay away? It doesn't matter. It never works. There was a time in the not-so-distant past that his words would have set me off, thrown me into a temper that would have left us both bloody. But something had changed, something that terrified and excited me both, something that utterly destroyed me, something that made me whole again. I did not know how far all of his betrayals ran, how deep or shallow his lies but I was starting to realize that in one respect, at least, it didn't matter. Some part of my pathetic heart was going soft for him again. Chapter 19 Love is the name for our pursuit of wholeness, for our desire to be complete. Plato Without another word, I went to make us both a cup of coffee. My hands were shaking badly, but either he didn't notice, or he was polite enough not to comment on it. Are you in town long? I asked him as I offered him his cup. He took it with a soft thank you, dragging a hand through his hair, eyes downcast. I don't know. I don't know what the hell I'm doing anymore, Scarlet. That is a fact. I stood over him studying him. I'd forgotten how thick his eyelashes were, double rowed and darker than his hair. I'd forgotten how well-defined his lush top lip was, how broad his shoulders were, so muscular they flexed even when he made a movement as small as taking a drink of his coffee. I'd forgotten that when he showed me the tiniest glimmer of vulnerability, it made me go weak as a babe. I'd forced myself to forget so many things about him, and I wondered, hardly daring to even hope, if it could be different now. Was there some chance that I could turn my bitter memories sweet again? Not all of them, of course not, but perhaps some? I still didn't know. Everything had changed, but the future was more uncertain than ever. I stroked a hand oh so softly over his hair, and his entire big body tensed, as though bracing for a blow. He had good instincts. I know, Dante. My voice was quiet, but the tremulous intensity of it reverberated through the room. I know. I don't have the faintest notion what you're talking about. Slowly and carefully, he set his coffee down on the side table to his right. You're such a liar, I told him, almost playfully, because for once, I had the upper hand. Finally, that had him looking up at me, meeting my eyes without flinching. Who have you been talking to? The question came out careful, his tone measured, deceptively harmless. I wasn't fooled. His face was bland still, except for his eyes. They were telling me a different story. A story of rage and violence, of his temper boiling, unchecked, just under the surface. If I gave him a name told him who had clued me in. Heads would roll. That's the least relevant thing you could ask, I finally answered, an evasion, but one I knew would be effective. I don't agree. Who? The bland veneer was slipping from his voice. I'll answer one of your questions, but not that one. My voice was almost teasing. He licked his lips, and it was an effort not to bend down and kiss him, what do you mean? I was in dangerous territory now. 
My urge to heal him was becoming as strong as my need to harm him. The answer is yes, I uttered softly. It hurt my tattered heart to get the words out, but I could not seem to keep them in. Confusion drew his brows together, his brilliant eyes studying my face. Yes to what? Yes, I do love you as much as I hate you. Something happened to his face. It fell and lifted as a shudder racked through him. Jesus, he whispered, again and again as he grabbed me, burying his face in my stomach, his big arms wrapping around me. My voice was grating, as brittle as breaking glass, as I added, It is a near draw, the love and the hate, but it could tip either way. I'm done with the lies, Dante. I have some questions, and you are going to answer them. He didn't let go of me. Didn't flee this time. Progress. What do you know? He asked carefully, voice muffled against my belly. His face was still pressed tightly to me. I touched his head lightly with my fingertips. My nails scraped roughly against his scalp as I gripped two good fistfuls of his hair, angling his head back, face up, forcing him to look up at my face. He let me, blinking slowly up at me. I bent down and pressed my mouth to his. He'd been drinking beer, I could tell. The taste of it was drugging on his breath, turned impossibly sweet. It brought back memories, good ones and bad, as all things did with Dante. I lingered at this kiss. I was running short on time, but I didn't hold back. When I finally tore my mouth from his, we were both panting hard. But I found the breath to say, You will come clean about this, or you will stay out of my life. He didn't say anything, and I thrusted myself away from him, moving a safe distance out of his reach. I assume you're staying somewhere in town? He just nodded looking a little dazed. I have to get back on set, but we're not finished here. Why don't you text me the address where you're staying? I'll come see you when I'm done working for the day. I'll wait here until you're finished. We can drive together. I chewed on my lip as I thought it out. Fine, as long as you've sobered up enough by then to drive. He grabbed his discarded cup of coffee, toasting it at me. Got it. Stuart felt we were on a roll that day, and so we ended up shooting hours longer than I'd even anticipated. We'd worked so deep into the night that p.m. had passed into a.m. hours prior. I figured Dante would have given up, would have left by the time I made it back to my trailer. I figured wrong. He was there and awake. And hell, he was even sober. Our eyes clashed for a few intense beats, before I moved to the small bedroom in the back, changing into street clothes. We talking here or at your place? I asked him as I came back out, grabbing my things. Or my place, I added. Mine, he answered instantly, rising from the sofa. What have you been doing in here for all this time? Meditating? He gave me a small smile for that. I kept busy, sobered up, went for a run, made some phone calls. I hadn't expected a semi-straight answer. Usually, he matched sarcasm with sarcasm. Who were you calling? I didn't really think he'd answer if it was anything besides business, but it never hurt to ask. I was trying to figure out who's been talking to you. I rubbed my hands together, a nervous tell. I made myself stop. And did you? No, I couldn't get anything concrete, so I've put some people on it. Unless, of course, you'd like to change your mind and tell me. I shook my head dismissively. Not likely. And it doesn't matter, truly. You should be more worried about what I know than who told it to me. His mouth twisted bitterly. Touché. That shut us both up for a while. I left my car in the lot, going with him. How long is the drive? I asked him. Not far, was all he said. I didn't press the issue. I'd find out soon enough. And I did, sooner than I thought, as though he'd found a place just to be close to the set. It was a scant ten-minute drive from the lot to his lodgings. 
You're staying at a house? I asked him as he parked. It was nice, not too huge, but heavily gated. It didn't seem like the type of place you could stay for just a few nights. Temporarily. If it's so temporary, why not just stay at a hotel? I needed more privacy. I require gates and tinted windows. I digested that and thought, just maybe, that I understood it. He parked his car in the U-shaped drive, stopping just shy of the front door. You have the place all to yourself? I asked, looking around. We do, yes. Do you like it? I shot him a look for that. It doesn't matter if I like it. I just came here to talk, and then leave. He firmed his jaw and nodded, looking away. He led us into the house silently, waving me in. I took a few steps into the entryway and stopped. The place was bigger than I thought from the outside. It was also fully furnished, well decorated too, with lots of grays and whites. It felt more like a private residence than a short rental. Do you mind if I shower before we talk? I shrugged. Whatever. Make yourself at home. The kitchen is stocked if you're hungry. I realized that I was. Just point me in the right direction. He showed me to the kitchen and left. I had just dished out omelet number two when he joined me again. I sent him one glance, then looked away again. He was in a fresh pair of sweatpants, these ones black, his muscular chest deliciously bare. His hair was still wet. I wanted to lick him, head to toe, twice, slowly. Instead, I asked, You run out of shirts? Yes. Feel free to take yours off, too, to make it less awkward. I curved my lips down to keep them from curling up, which they'd naturally tried to do. He wasn't allowed to charm me right now, the bastard. I handed him his plate. I could have waited to ask if he was hungry, but I hadn't seen the point. From what I recalled, he never turned down food. Like, ever. Thank you, he said. We sat down at a round table in the breakfast nook. It was a friendly spot, surrounded by windows. If we were there when the sun rose in a few hours, we'd likely have a killer view. I ate my omelet without a word, not looking at him. I had been collecting my thoughts for a while now, and I had too many questions. I didn't even know where to start, and I was hesitant to. If he started lying or evading, or so help me God, manipulating me again, this thing would be dead in the water. He finished his meal before I did, rising to take his plate to the sink, then came back to sit across from me. I felt him staring at me while I ate, but I didn't look up. I finished about half of my omelet before I pushed my plate toward him. I prepared us both the same portion size, just kind of assuming he'd finish what I didn't. Because he had, a thousand times before. Jesus, even eating together was like walking through a field of landmines. Put us together to do anything, and there was a memory behind it. A dozen. A hundred. We had words with whole lives attached to them. That was the burden of falling in love so young. Of letting yourself go so deep into another person. You owned too much of each other to ever really walk away. And we had proven as much, time and again. I waited until he finished the second plate and rose to take it to the sink. I got up and followed him. Your mother's been blackmailing you. It wasn't a question. I watched his back as I said the words, witnessed how he braced himself and shuddered like his whole world was crashing down around him. Because it was. He turned to look at me and I read too much in the agony of his eyes, knew too much from what they held. So many of my questions were answered from just that look, if I was honest with myself. But denial is a powerful thing, and I wouldn't have minded clinging to it for just a little bit longer. Yes. Yes. He said it with a sort of reverent lightness, as though some great weight had been lifted from him because years of burdensome secrets had just been taken off his shoulders. Jesus, I was a fool. Of course she has, 
he continued succinctly. Of course she has. Chapter 20 I know of only one duty, and that is to love. Albert Camus Present Dante I was shocked at myself, at my reaction to her words. I'd been avoiding this for so long, had gone through so much pain, suffered so much just to keep this from happening. I'd never imagined in my wildest dreams that my knee-jerk reaction to having it all come crashing down on me would be a torrential downpour of relief. I was weak with it. But also, of course, it was my worst nightmare. The very thing I had always dreaded. Because what she would do now that she knew terrified me. This place doesn't feel like a temporary rental to me, Dante, she said her voice somehow normal. Oh, now she was changing the subject. It was infuriating, but I answered her anyway. I am considering making it a more permanent residence. My mother can't know about it, you understand. As I spoke, I turned fully to look at her. She grinned, tilting her head to study me. An expression fell across her face, one I knew she didn't intend of almost curious affection. That look on her face was like a punch to the gut. So many feelings rushed at me when she studied me like that. Like years had disappeared and we were back to some petty arguing that meant nothing in the long term to us. Some form of the old bickering that we used to enjoy when we still had complete faith that our bond to each other was unassailable. This wasn't that. Of course I knew that. But it was painfully pleasurable to pretend that it could be like that even for only an evening. You plan to stay in L.A., close to me, as long as your mother doesn't know about it. She tapped her chin as she spoke, looking thoughtful. I made my face stay bland and neutral and just kept meeting her eyes, but it was no use. She was on to me, and I couldn't have said if I was more acutely relieved or utterly horrified by that. You don't know how much I know, she accused correctly. You have no idea how to handle me because, for once, you're more in the dark than I am. How does it feel, lover? Wretched. I gave her that one bitterly honest piece, because God, she deserved it. As wretched as you could hope. Care to clue me in? Of course not. You can guess and worry and stress your deceitful black heart out. And while you're doing that, you can make me a drink. I assume you have a bottle of superior scotch around here somewhere. I decided to take the order seriously, leading her from the kitchen to an adjoining sitting room. As she'd correctly guessed, I did have a fully stocked bar. I fixed us both a drink. I didn't have to ask her what she wanted or how she wanted it. It was all too familiar to me. What are you planning to do? I asked her, handing her a glass of scotch straight up. Are you going to confront anyone? She laughed, a sound of pure delight that reverberated through me, making my heart pound, reminding me that it was still a slave to her whims. Damn her. Who would I confront? And about what? What do I know, do you suppose? If I say I know everything, will you slip and tell me even more? I took strong exception to how much she was enjoying this. This isn't a game. Her smile died a short death, leaving behind the quiet rage that had never really left. You think I don't know that? Her voice was so full of icy bitterness that I could taste it in my own mouth. She could flay me alive with that tone, strip the skin from my bones. You think this was ever fun to me? Being lied to? Being manipulated? But I won't be answering your questions anymore. You'll be answering mine. I didn't argue with her. Instead, I toasted the air and finished my drink. I think I'd have agreed to anything just then if it kept her from leaving. 
if it meant she would keep coming back. I'd reached my threshold on living without her. As dangerous as it was, as much as it made my chest cold with fear, I was done staying away from her. And God help me, I didn't have the will to live with the lies anymore. So if I agree to answer your questions, I began, sometime later, charging bravely through the pregnant silence, determined to negotiate with her. Compromising had always, ironically, been one of our strengths. Ironic because two more prideful, stubborn souls had never walked the earth. I think, and had always assumed, that it only worked because we were so devoted to each other. We'd grown up as godless, savage creatures, believing in nothing so much as each other, and somehow it had always been enough. When you can't imagine living without a person, of course you'll do what's necessary, concede when you have to, to keep the peace. You'll stay with me, I forged ahead. We'll be together. She didn't answer for a long time, instead just looking at me, her eyes hard and unyielding. I studied her back, taking in her dear face like I could never have enough. Because I never could. I was always obsessed with her. It was one of the defining, consistent characteristics of my life. Obsessed not just with her perfections, but also with her flaws. Her stubborn pride even held a special place in my heart. It had ruined me as a person in so many ways, but God did it get to me. She took it to a level where, even when it was to your detriment, you almost had to admire it. But I had reached my limit. She would be compromising today. We had lapsed into a staring contest, one I was determined to win. I would have this from her. And so I did. She broke first, her hard eyes wavering, lids trembling for a heart-turning moment, before they watered and she looked away. We've been at war for so long. How do we just let that go? Her voice was tremulous from her loss. It wasn't easy for her to concede defeat. It never had been. We've been at war, all right, but you just didn't see that we weren't supposed to be fighting each other. It was wrong, but it's over now. I'm not asking for everything at once. I understand the damage that's been done here more than anyone. I'm just asking you to try. Give me your time, every spare moment of it, and I'll give you some answers. I had her. I saw it. In her clenched fists and quivering lips, I saw it. I moved a step closer. She braced but didn't move away. I took another step. She closed her eyes as my fingers traced over her brow. Feather light, I stroked her temples, sliding my hands back to cup her head. I gripped her hair with both hands and touched our foreheads together. You'll stay with me, I repeated. We'll be together. I needed this to be very clear, a verbal confirmation. There could be no miscommunications. We'd had enough of those. Then you'll tell me the truth, she said in a vulnerable voice that gutted me far quicker than a razor-sharp one could have. Yes, yes, I'll answer your questions. Your turn. I can't just let these things go. I can't just forgive. Not you, not me. I'm not asking you to, I explained. My tone was calm and reasonable, my heart pounding like a stampede. I'm not that greedy or that delusional. I asked you to be with me. The rest can come later. Her voice was barely audible in the quiet room, but piercing all the same. Yes, I'll be with you. She sounded uncertain and dismayed, but I'd take it. My eyes shut tight in acute relief, and I held her like that for a time, our foreheads touching, my fingers gently rubbing her scalp. I felt I could have stayed that way indefinitely. I was so grateful for the connection. But then she touched me, her hands reaching up, stroking lightly from my wrists down to my elbows and back again. 
and that was it. Sweetness turned base. Blood rushed through my body, my stomach clenching as lust kicked in. Too overwhelming to deny. It was an effort not to drag her down to the floor, or hell, push her to her knees. I straightened instead, pulling away from her, and she opened her eyes. They flitted from my face down to my bare chest. I dragged a hand through my hair and watched the way every movement of my body caught her attention. She licked her lips, and I twitched so hard that her gaze caught the movement darting farther down. She sucked in a deep breath that made her breasts shift, which caught my gaze. Her nipples were hard under her tight white cotton shirt. Without even willing it, my hand moved to her, thumb tracing over one of the hard little nubs. She sent me one long, sultry look and lowered to her knees. Jesus, I said. I steepled my hands at the crown of my head, eyes glued to her as she shrugged off her shirt, unclasped her bra, and slid it smoothly off. She rubbed her face against me like a cat, using her nose to play with me through the sweats. It was adorable and one of the most arousing things I'd ever witnessed. My stomach clenched as she opened my sweatpants, dragging them down freeing my heavy length to bob against her lush pink lips. Jesus. She just sucked my tip into her mouth when I snapped out of my trance. I tried twice before I found my voice. Wait. Stop. Me turning down head from Scarlet. That had to be a first. But I needed something else just then, and the urge was so realized, so complete that I never even considered denying it. When I spoke, my voice was hoarse with all the words I couldn't find for a need so powerful it left me shaken. I need to be inside of you. She laid her cheek against me, rolling her eyes up to look at mine. Let's go to the bedroom, I said thickly. She didn't agree or disagree, so I pulled her up, lifting her under the arms and propping her on her feet. I couldn't keep my hands to myself. I palmed her breasts and watched her jaw go slack. Fuck. I let her go, taking a step away as I pushed my stiff length back into my pants. Bedroom. I want you in the bedroom. I turned, heading down the hallway, through the entryway, and up the double staircase. I headed for the east wing of the house, aware every step that a topless scarlet followed. This place is bigger than I thought, she observed, her tone neutral. Do you like it? I hoped so. I'd purchased it with her personal preferences in mind, because it was for her. Sure. At least it wasn't a no. My mouth twisted wryly as I showed her our bedroom. The house was for her. The bedroom for me. Subtle she said wryly. The ceiling over the bed and every wall that wasn't a window was mirrored. What can I say? I like to watch. It's the first time we've had a house to ourselves. I might have gone a little overboard. Proving my own point, my eyes were on her in the mirror as I spoke. She met my gaze, hers enigmatic. You planned this all along. I shrugged. It was too complicated to explain, the efforts I had gone to based on the most meager thread of hope, and I was not in the mood to talk. We were of a like mind, apparently, because she started peeling off her jeans without another word. I shoved out of my sweats, my eyes glued to her, raking over her, devouring every inch of skin she bared. When she was bare, I was on her pushing her to the bed, straddling her, pressing my chest to hers, our warm flesh rubbing together, creating more friction than I needed to ignite. I cupped her face in both hands and kissed her, shifting on top of her, wedging myself between her legs. I pulled back to watch her face as I breached her, near mindless with need. Abruptly and unexpectedly, she began to struggle, 
pushing me off her. I moved back with a jerk, too stunned to protest. Not like that, she said, flushing. She sat up, not looking me in the eye. Not face to face. Not right now. It stung, but I told myself it was fine. She had given me so much in such a short time. It was a miracle that she was even here. Clearly, more time was needed for certain intimacies. But if I worked on her long enough, she wouldn't hold back. It was inevitable. Left to our own devices, we would give each other everything. Because that was the order of the universe. I truly believed that. I brushed off the sting and accommodated her. I was too far gone to split hairs, my mind in a dark and primitive place that didn't particularly care about anything except getting balls deep inside of her and rutting like an animal. She showed me just what she wanted by moving to a large chaise lounge that dominated the corner of the room closest to the shoe closet I hadn't yet shown her. She climbed onto the cream-colored piece of furniture, getting on hands and knees, positioned right on the edge. I didn't need to be told twice. I was covering her back, arms reaching around to palm her breasts, my tip butting up against her entrance between one thumping heartbeat and the next. I shut my eyes with that first drugging thrust. She was wet, pliant, so I didn't hold back, jamming into the hilt without preamble. The noise that escaped me right as her wet heat covered the base of my shaft was more animal than human. I was not a thinking being in that moment. I was mindless. Her slave. I watched us in the mirrors, watched myself going in and out of her, watched my cock squeezing in and dragging out slowly, then faster, frenzied. As soon as she began to get loud, close to her release, I slowed the rhythm again. She was braced on all fours, her back arched, but her head was turned with mine, watching our bodies, never meeting my eyes no matter how long I stared at hers, trying to catch her gaze. Again, it stung, but it was a battle for another day. I watched her face while my body pumped into hers, watched her watching where we joined, and that did it. I'd wanted to last longer, wanted to savor more, but it was hopeless. I should have been amazed with myself for lasting as long as I had. The first touch of her nose nuzzling my shaft back in the living room had nearly had me coming in my pants. I kissed her nape while I emptied inside of her, savoring with complete pleasure that moment of total abandon where I lost myself in her. My mind blown to bits. I was still coming spurting after effects deep in her womb when I lifted my head to watch her slack-jawed release, caught the way her eyes glazed over as the skin-tingling rush of her orgasm overtook her. It was breathtaking, a heaven worth going through hell for. I'd never thought otherwise. And the best part of all, I got to have her again, and again. And I did. I was greedy with it, insatiable, voracious. She brought me to life. I had her as many times as I could before she cried uncle. There was never an end to this need she created inside of me, this endless chasm of want in my blood for her. Never had been, never would be. Chapter 21 I wanted the whole world or nothing. Charles Bukowski Past Scarlet Graham was not happy about my decision to get a job. Dante less so. He was irate, predictably belligerent about it. He threw such a fit initially that Graham ordered him to go for a run. When we were alone, she tried several different tactics to get me to change my mind. She was a formidable woman, not used to hearing no. And when she did hear the word, she didn't even consider accepting it. It was nothing but a challenge to her. It was the closest we'd come to really butting heads. 
That alone almost made me cave. Darling, she said with her most charming smile, we only just got you here. I was looking forward to your company. It was the principle of the thing. I would not, could not, end up like my parents, like my grandmother. I've made up my mind, I told her stubbornly. It's not a big deal, just a few hours on school nights, a few more on weekends. Now that I've quit drama, I have plenty of free time. She tried a different tactic. I knew she would. I wouldn't get your hopes up. It's the wrong season for part-time jobs. I guarantee no one is hiring. I swallowed hard. I already have one. The manager of the Five and Diner hired me on the spot. I start on Monday. Her eyes narrowed on me. It's quite unnecessary. Why on earth would you need a job? Any need you have, I'm happy to provide for. Just tell me what it is you're earning money for. I'll buy it for you, darling. I gave her brutal honesty. Not because I wanted to, and not because I wasn't grateful. It was a matter of self-worth. If I was ever going to get some, I knew I had to earn it. I can't be a Durant charity case. Not more than I can help. At least if I get a job, I'm trying to take care of myself. She gave me the coldest look I'd ever seen her aim my way. It made me shiver and instantly want to take back whatever I'd said that put that look on her face. She was a force of nature like that. What she felt, you felt. If she was happy, the world knew joy. When she was angry, yeah, you felt that too. And when she was disappointed in you, you felt like absolute shit. I'm sorry that you thought this was charity, she said, with haughty chill. You thought I felt some sense of duty toward you, and here I thought I was doing it out of love. Silly me. Her tone was scathing, a vacuum of disdain. It sucked all warmth from the room, took my stubborn pride, and left me feeling ashamed and alone. I was out of my league. A trash can girl could not hope to go head to head against a queen. I shook it off, shed the feeling. I would not back down on this, not even against Graham. I, 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 I'm s s s sorry it c c came out that way. I'm not uh, uh, ungrateful, but, 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 but I'm c c c keeping the j job. The stutter did her in. Her hard expression went soft and she let out a soft, Oh, my darling girl, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my temper. You see now where Dante gets it. I won't stop you from having this job, if you really think it will make you happier. I just worry about you. I wasn't sure if I was relieved or completely humiliated that I'd won because of pity, but I took it all the same. Graham was one obstacle, Dante another. Over the years, we'd learned to pick our battles with each other. What that meant was basically whoever cared more won. Whoever cared less compromised. I just assumed I'd be winning this one. I didn't count on him freaking out, his hellish temper coming out to play. No, he said to me first thing as he came back from his run. He was sweaty and agitated. He looked good enough to eat. But it was the wrong approach. I already have the job. I was hired to wait tables. You're just going to have to get used to the idea. No, I'm putting my foot down about this one. A fight it was. Excuse me? You heard me. Hello, Temper. It's me, Scarlet. What are we going to do about this bossy son of a bitch? Likely nothing productive. Still, we'd try. What the hell is your problem? And when did you get the idea you could tell me what to do? Why the hell do you want a job? If you need something, just tell Graham. I rolled my eyes, making sure he saw it. Spoken like a true trust fund, baby. I need to start making my own money. Why? Why do you care? He was right in my face, leaning down to me. I met him glare for glare. Why do you always have to push it? I don't sleep at night, worrying about you since the attack. And now you want to go off on your own for hours a day? And for what? That softened me a bit. 
He's dead, Dante. He can't bother me or anyone else ever again. And what about that fucking cop? If he gets wind of you working as a waitress, he'll bother you every day. I swallowed the lump in my throat. Now there he had a point. I'm sorry you're worried, but I'm not quitting. I can't live my life in fear of what-ifs, and I can't be a Durant charity case for the rest of it either. I need to be more independent. What? What the hell is that supposed to mean? It means I'm a loser. I don't do anything. I don't contribute. I'm living here in a mansion, and I've done nothing to earn it. That's bullshit. You're a high school student. That's your job right now. That was laughable. I was a C student on a good day, when I was actually trying. Most days I didn't even try. My mind tended to wander as soon as a teacher started talking. I don't deserve any of this, Dante. I don't deserve to be here. Deserve? What does that even mean? And if you don't deserve to be here, I don't either. It was so outrageous, I almost felt slighted by it. Insulted. Please, look at you. With your perfect GPA, your scholarships, your college applications, your SAT scores, your popularity, your football, your perfect everything. You belong here, in a house like this, in a life like this. The only thing about you that doesn't fit in here is that, for some reason, you want to be with me. That got to him. I'd been bringing up a sore spot of mine, but I saw I'd rubbed us both wrong. His voice when he spoke was derisive, offended. None of that's for me. You think I enjoy any of it? And do you think I have a choice? Those things are the bare minimum that's expected of me. The Durant heir. And even that is not enough. And you're not a fucking Durant charity case. You might as well be a Durant. You will be someday. Because you're never leaving me. Not happening. That did something to me. Played havoc with my heartstrings. Made me become more agitated and go soft. It was nothing so much as a hostile, backhanded proposal of marriage. But sucker that I was, it still made me melt. I was flushing as I tried to get back on topic. I'm keeping the job. His lips curled. He looked like he wanted to punch a wall. Fine, he bit out. But I'll drive you to and from. I didn't argue the logistics of it with him. I'd won. It was enough. I didn't need to rub it in his face. All that fussing aside, talking about having a job and the reality of it were two different things. After four days waiting tables, I wanted to quit. Pure stubbornness was all that kept me from it. People were rude, men were gross, and the manager was a lech. It was an old-fashioned diner with a pretty simple menu, but it seemed like I did nothing but screw orders up for at least the first week. And worse, much worse than any of that, five days into the job, Harris found me. He didn't do anything I could take real exception to at first. He just occupied a booth in the corner, ordered cup after cup of coffee, pretended to work on a laptop, and watched me. For hours. I tried my best to serve and then ignore him, but the barest amount of small talk was required for the job. Even for him. Do you bring your work here often? I asked him begrudgingly the first day he did this. He smiled warmly. Every day. Oh, joy. I asked my manager, Brett, about that at the end of the shift. He was an overweight, middle-aged man that I was a hundred percent sure had hired me because he thought I was attractive and he liked having eye candy around. As always, when he spoke to me, he addressed my breasts instead of my face. I think he's been in once or twice. Be nice to him. Don't charge him for coffee. Police discount. I tried not to roll my eyes and complied. Do you ever eat? I asked Harris on his third day of stalking me out in the open. He sat back in his seat, biting his lip. Something new had entered his eyes. Something I did not like. That an invitation? You want to grab a bite to eat with me after your shift? I blushed. Blushed like an innocent fool. 
I could tell he got off on it, and I wanted to kick myself. I have a boyfriend, I muttered and hurried away. He never did more than watch me. He never had the opportunity. Dante was true to his word. He dropped me off and picked me up every single shift. I was more thankful for it than I'd been anticipating. After the first day of Harris eye-fucking me for three hours, he was there when Dante showed up to get me. The two men had a volatile stare-down, but that was it. Harris made sure to leave before Dante showed up again. He was oily slick. It put me in a bad position. Harris wasn't doing anything, so there were no actions I could take to stop him. I told myself that I was bothered by him because I allowed myself to be bothered. I wanted to tell Dante about him, but how could I? It would prove his point. And besides and above that, there was not a damn thing he could do about it. There were a few times Harris stepped over the line, but even then it was a tenuous thing. And in a game of his word against mine, Mine meant shit to anyone that could have done something about it. I was a few weeks into this. I was at that point where I hated it, but I wasn't done fighting for it. My cursed stubbornness at its most counterproductive. Harris was doing his usual routine, inhaling bad coffee and unabashedly watching me. It was a particularly dead day, and the slowest part at that. There was a half-hour window between the after-school rush and the late dinner crowd, where we rarely had more than three customers sitting at a time. On this day, there was only one. My stalker cop. I was refreshing his coffee when he said, voice low and dirty, You sucked your boyfriend's dick today, didn't you? I can tell. Your lips are swollen. Was it this morning? You're living with him, right? Did you wake him up with your mouth around his cock? I'd frozen at the first sentence. Literally. I'd been pouring his coffee, and I just kept pouring, overfilling the cup until it ran in a slow dribble onto the table. I was mortified, face flushing in embarrassment and building temper, and he wasn't finished. Or was it in the car on the way over? Did he pull over to the side of the road and give you a throat full right before he dropped you off for your shift? That made me blush harder, because it wasn't far off from the truth. Had he been following us? Or was it really that obvious? You're disgusting, I told him with heartfelt venom. Careful. Remember that you don't want to rile me. I stormed away and refused to serve him for the rest of the shift. I just let him sit there, glaring at me. Later, when I'd collected my composure and calmed my rage enough to talk about it, I told on him to my manager. It fell on deaf ears, or rather, ears that could not have cared less. Don't piss him off. The last thing I want is trouble from the police, was all he said. Two strikes, I told myself. One more, and I was quitting. Chapter 22 Being deeply loved by someone gives you strength, while loving someone deeply gives you courage. Lao Tzu Present Dante Scarlet woke up moody and cross after about four hours of sleep. She had to be on set again. I'd selfishly deprived her of sleep, and she let me know it. When I tried to shower with her, she locked me out of the bathroom. I was repentant to a point. I was sorry she was exhausted, but I also knew it had been unavoidable. She was lucky to have gotten any sleep at all. I was driving her to the studio before she spoke the thing on both of our minds. What does Adelaide have on you? Tell me. I tried not to let my face so much as twitch. You want to do this now? On your way into a long day of work? She didn't answer, which was answer enough. This role was important to her. Even at her most self-sabotaging, she wasn't going to screw it up. And aside from the previous night's unavoidable sleep-depriving gluttony, I wouldn't be screwing it up for her either. Tonight, she stated stonily, a faint but unmistakable hint of a threat in her voice. And I knew what the threat was. Of course I did. 
I needed to talk or proof she was gone. Tonight, I agreed. Are your roommates still on a trip? Yes, they come back late tomorrow. This next part I didn't like. It went against the grain of every instinct I had. But I'd barely balked at doing what needed to be done. When they're home, you sleep at your apartment. My tone was careful. I was going for neutral, but it came out more than a touch pained. I felt her staring at me. Her eyes were burning a hole into the side of my face. I kept my gaze resolutely on the road. Okay, she said simply. She wasn't even going to ask. I hated that. Hated that she might not really care. That somehow she could go even one more night without me and not need a reason why. I'd spent many, many nights without her. But I'd always, always had my reasons and known them too well. But if she was going to let it drop, I had to let her. I had so many blows to deliver. I needed to pull punches whenever, wherever, however I could. Maybe if I could space out the damage, it would do less lasting harm to her. One could hope. I was less a man for wishing and more a creature of action, but I'd take anything I could get. The drop-off didn't go well. She tried to dart out of the car without a goodbye, but I stayed her with a firm grip on her wrist. A kiss, I told her solemnly. We would get back on track. We had to. I'd been through hell and back, had lost faith in everything except for this, her and me, simply because I had refused, despite every awful thing working against us, to let it go. Sometimes faith is a choice. We would get back on track. She was as far from me as she could get in the restrictive confines of the vehicle. It was a small car, though, a Jaguar F-type, so we were still pretty damned close. Scarlet, just a kiss. I'll behave myself, I promise. She watched me warily. I can't, Dante. I don't have any time. I need to keep my game face on here. This role is important to me. I knew, absolutely knew, that she was just making excuses. It hurt, but I'd been hurt worse. I told myself that it wouldn't always be this way. Just a kiss on the cheek, then, and then we'll say goodbye. I cajoled. She was worrying at her lip, looking at me like I might bite because she knew me. But she slowly nodded and leaned a bit closer. I met her more than halfway, placing a chaste, loving kiss on her cheek, then her forehead than her other cheek. Her breath was coming out in little pants, her eyes closed, lips parted. So much for chaste. I rubbed our lips together, tongue darting to lick hers tentatively, and then deeper, stroking into her mouth, my hands going to cup her face. She moaned deep in her chest, a sound of abject need, and started sucking on my tongue. I pulled back with a gasp, her face was stunned for a moment, but it quickly turned into a glare. I almost smiled. See you tonight. Bastard. She got home late, and I was waiting up for her. Even if I could have put it off another day, I wasn't sure I wanted to at this point. I was ready to come clean, to get it all out in the open at last. God, it was a long time coming. Scarlet didn't draw it out. We'd barely cleared the bedroom door when she said, What does she have on you? Tell me. I stopped mid-stride, turning to her. She'd gone by her apartment before she'd come over and packed an overnight bag. I'd carried it upstairs for her and still had it clutched in my right hand. I dropped it on the floor, just staring at her for a minute. Where to even begin? I felt my head shake, a slow, precise movement, a little to the right, a little to the left. It was enough, so simple but so telling. Her face froze. That, she said dully. Of course. For how long? You know, I said. I watched as comprehension struck. 
It was a terrible thing. The look in her eyes would haunt me to the end of my days. Haunted. Like everything with us, the hurt cut both ways. She made you break up with me. She said it like she didn't quite believe it. You'd think the truth would be less harmful than the lies, I told her. But sometimes the truth is the hardest thing to stomach, especially if you knew that some part of you should have seen it all along. Of course. Two words. Straightforward. Brutal in their simplicity. She jerked like she'd been struck, her blinking eyes searching the room frantically, looking anywhere but at me. When you made that phone call, she paused. Both of those phone calls, she corrected herself. She was with you, wasn't she? Her voice broke on the question, her tone so raw it made my chest ache and my eyes sting. But I answered her. Of course. And there it was. She staggered where she stood. I was over in a beat going to her, but I was a second too late. She had collapsed to the floor. I'd only ever seen her once like this, bowed in on herself. Broken, bent, boneless in her pain, a pile on the floor. Completely defeated. Destroyed. Even with the way I'd known, because I had absolutely known that I'd broken her heart. The pain of it had never made her shoulders less straight. Her pride, which was both the bane of my existence and one of the things that had saved us both, had only ever left her one time before. And now. I scooped her up in my arms and carried her to bed. She was shaking and crying, the sobs quiet but powerful, rocking her entire body in waves until she was convulsing against me. I'd hurt her, and myself more. I'd had to lie, had to, but I wished I could make her believe one truth. Her pain was always worse for me than my own. She was inconsolable, sobbing in my arms like her heart was breaking all over again. Eventually she spoke, haltingly and in near incoherent fragments. The things we've done to each other the things we've done to ourselves. You don't know. It's all in the past, I murmured into her forehead. I was running my hand over her head, over and over, petting her. It was an old familiar gesture, the way I always used to comfort her before our lives had gone to shit. We can put it in the past and leave it there. We can move on. We will find a way to move on. I told her the words ringing desperate because I was trying to convince myself as well. You don't know, she sobbed brokenly. You don't know. I shut my eyes, old familiar pain washing over me. My voice was thick with emotion when finally I said, I do know. We both do now. All that's left is to move forward. She started shaking her head and didn't stop. No. No, you don't know. You don't know. What don't I know, Angel? Tell me. I'll try to fix it, whatever it is. But she wouldn't say. She was done talking and back to weeping. She was so upset she'd bitten her lips bloody. She didn't seem to notice. Her eyes shut tight. But I did. It was another thing I'd only seen her do one time before. Quietly and firmly with my fingers, I made her stop. Shh, shh, it's okay. I soothed her, blotting at her lips with my shirt. All the while, my heart was breaking all over again. She didn't ask me any more questions that night, and I was relieved. We'd both reached our threshold on suffering for the moment. I hoped that the worst was past us, but I've never had much luck with hope. Chapter 23 Life is hard. After all, it kills you. Catherine Hepburn Past Scarlet
Do you know the kind of trouble that old bitch has gotten me into? Do you even care that you're messing with my career? All I've ever done is care about you and try to do right by you. And this is how you repay me? Harris spoke to me in a low, mean voice, pitched quiet enough that his words didn't carry beyond his usual stalking booth in the diner. That was the first time I started to get a real sense that he was delusional. He seemed to have some idea in his head of what our relationship was, and it was not even remotely close to reality. I don't know what you're talking about, I said stoically. I started to move away. Vivian Durant. She's been prying into my actions, questioning my methods. She went over my head to my superiors, and because she's filthy rich, they're listening to her. Finally, an encouraging development. It made me feel brave enough to say, Good, maybe you should stop bothering me every day. Maybe you should give up on stalking teenage girls altogether if you don't want to get into trouble for it. I dodged away when I saw the look on his face. If we'd been alone with him looking at me like that, I'd have been very concerned for my safety. Harris stopped coming to the diner after that. I thought that was the end of it. I really did. I stopped worrying about him. Stopped dreading any possible run-ins. Stopped letting fear rule my actions. Graham had scared him off, and that was that. Yay for Graham. I put him out of my mind. But Harris was only biding his time. He was patient and determined, and he held all of the power. He showed up at school one day. He had no trouble pulling me out of class. All it took was a brief conversation with my English teacher, and that was it. Scarlet, Mrs. Cohen called. Detective Harris would like a word. The girl next to me muttered, The hot cop is here for you? Lucky girl. I walked out into the hallway, turning to look at Harris. I folded my arms across my chest, stance belligerent, expression belligerent, attitude belligerent. He killed that little bit of defiance soon enough. Your boyfriend is finally being charged for that murder. A warrant's been issued, and some officers are planning to pick him up at football practice. I felt ill, literally. I thought I might throw up. I'd been so sure he was in the clear, that it was completely behind us. And now this? Why are you telling me this? I asked Harris carefully. His motives, as usual, were baffling to me. I think you can help him. Come into the station. Give a new statement. We can go over every word that creep said to you. You remember all of those unsolved, violent rape cases in the county? The disappearances? I think your attacker was our guy. Help me fill in some blanks. The more dangerous that bum looks, the more innocent your boyfriend will be. I was wringing my hands, looking at him uncertainly. I really didn't want to go anywhere with Harris but I wanted to help Dante more. I found myself caving. I know it's a pain in the ass, Harris said with a friendly smile. But it won't take long, and it might make all of the difference. At least you get to ditch school for it. I agreed to go to the station with him. On the way out of school, we saw only one person as we walked through the halls to exit. Tiffany was at her locker, fishing something out. She stopped and watched us as we passed her. Harris was walking just in front of me, but I slowed and let him get farther ahead as we came even with her. If you see Dante, will you tell him that Harris took me out of school? Tell him I need to talk to him as soon as possible. I said the words in a quick jumble, not wanting Harris to hear. Tiffany nodded solemnly, looking back and forth between my earnest face and Harris's retreating back. Will do, she said. She looked sincere. It was the most civil exchange we ever had, and the most damaging. I hurried to catch up to Harris before he realized I'd stopped to talk. I didn't trust him, but apparently, I trusted him too much. In my defense, I did not think he would do, or could do, what he did in broad daylight. But I did get into his car without a fight. Chapter 24 I started looking for you, not knowing how blind that was. Lovers don't finally meet somewhere. They're in each other all along. Rumi 
present. Scarlet. I woke up feeling rested and almost peaceful. Crying yourself to sleep apparently made for a good night's rest. It didn't hurt that my head was pillowed tenderly against a familiar chest, that I could hear the deep, throbbing beat of Dante's heart. It was so comforting that I had myself half convinced I was still sleeping. It was one thing to wake up with him, another to be comforted by it. What strange new world was this? I couldn't believe he was real, that this was. That after all of the war, we could have a moment of real peace. Or that we were looking at trying to carve out some kind of a future together. But was this even that? Or was this just another temporary reprieve? I didn't know, and I didn't want to think about it. Instead, I allowed myself a moment, a few, a dozen, a hundred, to revel in the arms of the only man who would ever own my heart. His bare torso was warm, firm, and very real. But I ran my hands over him like he might disappear. I could touch him now, and not as a way to hurt or wound. My hand on his chest spoke of the ownership I had been denying myself for five rough years. Five hopeless years. Five hateful years. Five lost years. Morning, angel. His voice came out of his chest in a touchable rumble that spoke of deep affection. He kissed the top of my head, his familiar hand stroking over my hair. I shut my eyes, letting myself enjoy it, letting myself acknowledge just how much I needed it. This would take some getting used to. I was still afraid to even hope I might get the chance. Mmm, I mumbled into his chest. It didn't mean anything just a general sound of contentment. He shifted me onto my back, propping up on one elbow, close to my side. I touched his face. Part of my mind was still in that fuzzy place between sleep and full cognizance. Are you real? I whispered it, like I was afraid someone else might hear the silly question. He grinned, shifting closer. His free hand grabbed one of mine, bringing it to his lips. He placed a soft, open-mouthed kiss on my palm. His eyes smiled as he dragged the hand down, cupping it over his very happy morning erection. Is that real enough for you? I glared at him. He threw his head back and laughed. His laugh was wonderful, touchable. I set my hand to his throat just to feel closer to it. His laughing eyes came back to mine, and his face sobered in one quick fall. He touched my cheek. Jesus, that look. What are you trying to do to me here? I let my eyes answer that question. With a groan, he leaned down and kissed me. It was a tentative contact at first, his talented lips feeling at mine with utmost care, his own way of validating that I was real. It was almost sweet and finished too quickly. He started to pull back, but I stopped him by grabbing his face, crushing his mouth to mine. The need came sudden and dark. I had to have him. Had to. On me. In me. I craved that most intimate connection. Him in the deepest part of me, with ravenous simplicity. When he pulled back again, I let him, my breath coming short. Now... It was a plea, an order, a curse, all in one. Well, if you insist, he muttered. He was such a fake. He'd lost his senses several thumping heartbeats earlier, and we both knew it. He descended on me again, mouth on my jaw, kissing down to my neck, over my collarbone, moving down. He peeled off my oversized cat t-shirt, lips coming back to my bare skin. When he sucked my nipples, my back arched off the bed, my toes curling in delight. I was so primed that I thought he might bring me over with that contact alone. But he didn't linger there long, moving inexorably lower and lower, nuzzling between my legs, eating me out like I was a feast and he was starved. That made two of us. When he'd put a fork in me, 
Done. Finished me. He laid his cheek against my inner thigh. His drowning blue eyes aimed up the line of my body at mine and managed to look winsome. I shut my eyes and stroked his hair. I was having a battle with myself, feeling too emotional, wanting to tamp it down, to reprimand the part of me that lived for this, that thought my entire reason for existing was wrapped up in it. In the end, emotion won, aided by sensation. He was licking his way up my stomach, nuzzling, kissing, touching everything with his fingertips, like he would memorize me, though I knew he'd burned every detail of me into his brain a very long time ago. This was just a refresher course. By the time his mouth made its way